climate resilience initiative. Um, I'm delighted to moderate our panel of policy representatives from Belgium, Germany, and the Netherlands, and directors from the three participating United Nations University Institutes, as well as researchers from the core team who will lead the initiative's agenda and work. And my name is Keith Burnett. I'm a senior communications advisor at UNU Merit, and I will navigate us through the next 45 minutes. Our aim today is to tell you about the initiative and to think about how we can create climate resilient communities and how we develop and integrate cross-border climate resilient strategies. And as we saw from the floods that swept across much of Europe in July last year, significant gaps were revealed in much of our understanding of extreme events. Events that in the coming years and decades will likely become more frequent, possibly more extreme. And as you can see from the setup of the Climate Resilience Initiative itself, we're bringing together partners from across flood affected countries in Europe, as well as other flood prone areas of the world, with an overall objective to share knowledge, shape policy and drive action. And reflecting the cross border nature of these issues and of climate change more generally, uh, UNU institutes in Bruges, Bonn and Maastricht, that's UNU CRIS, UNU EHS and UNU Merit, have joined forces to create this initiative and the associated Flood Knowledge Summit, which is a major event that will take place in July. Now, we'll hear more about uh, the summit shortly, as well as, of course, the initiative, and about the issues around this important topic, including risk preparedness, emergency responses, financial instruments to build back better, and local and cross-border governance. And we're going to do this in three sections, with contributions first from our policymakers, then our researchers, and then the Institute's directors. I'll introduce each section and participants as we go, so not everyone up front and at once. And we have a lot to get through, so I'm gonna do my best to keep everyone to time, and I hope the speakers will forgive me any interruptions. And for the audience, if you have comments, please leave them in the chat facility, or you can email us or comment on Twitter. Uh, and so that means we can record and digest them uh, as we don't have a formal Q&A session. Rather, we're relying on the participants to tell us about their own work and in the context of the initiative. So I'm going to start with opening remarks from three participants. Uh, we have Patrick van der Broek, who is chair of the Water Board in Limburg in the Netherlands and Bernard Mazane, who is Chief of Cabinet of the Federal Minister for Climate, the Environment, Sustainable Development, and the Green Deal in Belgium. And we also have Petra Berkner uh, from a sponsor of the initiative. Uh, that's the Directorate General for European and International Cooperation in Education and Research, the Federal Ministry of Education and Research, the BMBF in Germany. And I think we're going to start with Patrick, yes, uh, you or, are... or I do apologize. I think that we now have uh, Petra Berkner, who is able to join us, and I think going to go first. Is that is that okay with you, Petra? Uh, that's okay with me. But I'm Great. very sorry to tell you that I'm not Petra personally. I'm Sarah, and I will represent her today because due to technical problems. Petra Bergner cannot connect to today's lounge and she's very sorry about it. And she asked me to read her welcome note, if that's okay for you. Sarah, that's perfect. The words okay. are important. And, and okay. apologies for any uh, technical issues, but okay. please welcome okay. and please read the message. Thank, Thank you. you. That's very nice. Good morning and welcome. I hope you are all well. On behalf of the Federal Ministry of Education and Research, I would like to welcome you to the virtual launch of the UNU's Climate Resilience Initiative. Last summer, we had the experience of climate change in action right on our doorsteps. Several of my colleagues who live in the R region have been personally affected. Some lost their homes. The catastrophic floods have shown in the most brutal way just how vulnerable we are but they have also underlined that it is high time to take action. And that's why the Federal Ministry of Education and Research has decided to fund several projects to support local communities to protect themselves against the impacts of extreme weather events. Let me give you two examples. 
the project named HOVAS 2021 Governance and Communication in the Flood Crisis of July aims to improve flood warnings and the evacuation of areas affected by extreme weather events. In the CAR project, the BMBF is funding scientific expertise to support reconstruction in the areas affected by the floods. The aim of this project is to ensure that reconstruction is designed to be climate resilient in order to prevent future flood disasters. The rebuilding measures will be drawn up in close consultation with the local population in order to gain broad acceptance. These projects are part of our funding priority Urban and Regional Action for Climate Resilience, which has a budget of more than 40 million euro. The BMBF not only supports national measures to tackle the impact of flooding, it very much advocates the international linking of measures. The United Nations University provides an ideal platform for this. Together, we can learn from the experiences of European and global partners and develop measures for the transformation of affected areas. The BMBF supports the efforts of the joint initiative of UNU EHS in Bonn, UNU Chris in Bruges, and UNU Merit in Maastricht. And we are looking forward to the findings within this initiative. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Sarah, thank you for your message from Thanks. Petra Berkner and the BMBF and your important support, and also actually for highlighting the international nature of. Uh, this initiative. So thank you. Um, Patrick, Patrick van der Broek from the Water Board in Limburg. Over to you now. Yes, uh, thank you for inviting me in this uh, meeting. Uh, het liefste had ik natuurlijk in mijn moedertaal gesproken, uh, oder nog besser wäre in mijn tweede muttersprache, Deutsch, which I have chosen for English, what I of course can understand, but it is uh, language which I am uh, uh, the most less uh, capable of. So in forward uh, my excuse for um, um, uh, my worst uh, English. Uh, first of all, uh, water boards we have in the Netherlands uh, um, um, on the whole 21 uh, water boards. So it's the, the country uh, complete covering. Um, and these are uh, democratic chosen boards, um, which have also the uh, capacity of um, uh, ending uh, taxes. Well, what exactly happened in uh, July um, uh, last year, uh, it was a kind of a perfect storm. Uh, first of all, there was an enormous amount of rain in the south of uh, the province of, uh, of Limburg, uh, which was followed very quickly by an enormous amount of water in our secondary uh, uh, rivers, as the Geul, uh, the Gulp, uh, the, the Roer, and then quickly followed by uh, an enormous amount of water in our uh, primary water system, uh, the Maas. Um, and these were three historic uh, amounts of, of water which came together in about uh, 24 hours. So it was an absolute uh, major uh, crisis. When you compare it to Germany or uh, to Belgium, uh, we were uh, enormously lucky. Uh, um, in the Netherlands, there were no um, people who, who were killed by this uh, um, uh, crisis in Germany and Belgium, uh, more than uh, 200 people um, um, in total. Uh, the uh, impact is also uh, uh, unprecedented in this region. Um, 200, uh, uh, 2,500 homes and 600 businesses were damaged. And uh, yesterday we had also, um, yeah, Another crisis, but the water levels were also uh, again rising in the, in the hill. Uh, and I spoke again with people living in the area, and they are, they are uh, um, um, and many people which uh, have still not uh, uh, could go to their own homes. They still live in hotels or in uh, holiday homes because uh, their own homes is, uh, are, are, are still. Um, 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 too saturated with, uh, with water. So um, 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 the total amount of uh, uh, cost is about uh, 1.8 billion euros uh, on the whole um, in, uh, um, uh, in Limburg. Uh, what did we do? Um, we have uh, our systems for the primary uh, water systems, so for the mass, for the mass uh, 
on 200 locations, we built up 4.2 kilometers of um, uh, walls um, uh, to, um, um, yeah, to 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 uh, um, to keep the water in uh, in the in the river. Um, normally, we take uh, five uh, days to do so, and now we managed to do it in uh, in 50 hours. So it was. Um, um, I'm very proud that that my organization was uh, capable of uh, doing uh, that. Um, one of the, um, the biggest challenges were working together together with uh, other uh, governments. So the security region, um, it's, uh, um, the security region, um, it's uh, working together with the police, the, the, police, the, the, the fire brigade, the ambulance, uh, of course, uh, measures of, of the several, several towns. Um, um, we learned we had more to speak each other's language and uh, we had to learn um, what you can expect from from each, each other each other and also what we do not can expect from each other uh, and because of um, there are so, so many crises at so many different places uh, the first days it's it, it was was a bit of chaos of, uh, working uh, together but in about two or three days we managed it uh, very well also with help of uh, um, uh, of the army um, the priorities for the future um, to be better prepared. Um, first of all, a better warning system. Um, I was uh, really surprised uh, when I heard that uh, we don't have access to uh, um, uh, water warning systems, for example, in, in Belgium. Um, when we know, uh, and it's especially uh, um, a recording to the secondary water system. So in the in the primary system, it's okay, but the secondary water system, which is a new event, we never thought about that we could have such a crisis in the secondary water system. So primary, it's it's essential that we have a warning system cross cross border. And um, I, I I hereby ask for help to uh, organizations which uh, contribute contribute to this uh, meeting uh, to, to, to make contact in, in Belgium so that we can work together on that, uh, on that uh, theme. Uh, secondary, um, um, uh, um, discover where can, we, um, uh, where can we water retain? Where are places where you, where you can store water when there is uh, too much water? And on the other side, when you have water stored, you have also water in dry periods, so it, these are two sides of the of the same uh, uh, um, coin, uh, and then um, um, at last uh, make a big uh, master plan. We have um, uh, we have estimated that it is about uh, one point two billion euros are necessary to um, to challenge in the in the in the future uh, these uh, these uh, these crises. Um, um, I hope that I uh, that you pointed out one finger, so I have no one minute. Uh, I give you the one minute. These are the uh, the lines which I would like to have uh, shared with you. Uh, and um, if there are any questions, of course, I am uh, open to it. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you very much, and um, I and thank you for giving the time um, and for the English, my Dutch, German, French, etc. I'm, I'm going to match your English, so thank you. Um, Bernard, you're next, and you have, I believe, some slides to show us as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Pete. Good uh, afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for having me on the platform. Um, in Belgium, we have some in initiatives on, on climate resilience, but today I will focus on uh, one new one in uh, particular, Ocam Climate. Next slide, please. I have prepared uh, a couple of um, a couple of points. Yeah, I was asking for the next slide. And the next one. And the next one, I starting with an introduction. Um, it's... Um, it's coming with delay, I think. I'm asking for the next one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, this is the kind of pictures we know uh, for sure for 2021. And it was referred to by the colleagues that also in Belgium, Netherlands and Germany, um, we, we really 
could observe and, and, and uh, see the impact of climate change. Next slide, please. Um, so that's the reason why, yeah, we don't talk anymore about climate change. It's about climate crisis, emergency, and that we feel, at least in uh, Belgium, also in the federal government, that the assessment of the current governance uh, should be uh, on the table to improve climate uh, resilience. Next slide, please. Um, we in Belgium, we, at least from my minister uh, responsible for the environment and climate, we see climate up as one of the nine planetary boundaries as defined by the Stockholm Resilience Center uh, that will become uh, important when I uh, highlight uh, the new initiative. Next slide, please. The new initiative um, is called, uh, it's a working title, OCAM Climate. And the reason for that is that we are mirroring uh, the OCAM that exists already in Belgium uh, for terrorism. Um, and in fact, it's also connecting the dots. That is what we're aiming at with OCAM Climate. Next slide, please. Um, we know it's very, very complex context. And when we were preparing uh, last summer a decision for the government, um, we were lucky also to, to find, next slide, please, to find an article published in April 2021 by uh, Simpson et al, uh, Israeli um, researchers from South Africa, um, where they have, well, well-known figure here, uh, but detailed this figure, and where we could say that indeed determines hazards, exposure vulnerability are key to analyze and assess the risk. Um, and that's exactly where this OCAM climate uh, will be placed in the center of all this. And so one of the questions to me was, what can uh, researchers do? Well, uh, OCAM Climate will draw on the findings from uh, research on hazards, research on exposure, and research on vulnerability. And the aim is for sure to increase climate resilience in, in Belgium um, and, and do that, I mean, the analysis uh, in a detailed and continuous way. I draw your attention to the right button. You see laws and damage, you see adaptation, that might be obvious, but we will include mitigation as well. Think about the risk of the criticality of uh, raw materials in order to reach our objectives in terms of renewables and technologies. Next slide, please. Um, it's um, really a complex context, and I will not dwell on this figure, but author Simpson et al., for example, they are indicating that if you want to come to recommendations, if you want to put the response on the table as a, as a fourth determinant, then you can have different categories of uh, interaction uh, with a, a raising uh, a complex situation. Next slide, please. This is really the, the image uh, we have been using to go to the uh, Belgian Council of Ministers uh, in autumn of last year, 2021, and ask for a, a, a decision. Next slide, please. A decision where um, you can read here, I will not read the whole, uh, whole paragraph, but that we talk about a, a coordinating body for risk analysis and assessment of the climate uh, crisis it's a center of knowledge, multidisciplinary in expertise, trying to set up an interfederal, meaning working with the regions, reporting to the National Security, Security Council, and indeed the focus is on climate change, but we will look into the links with, for example, the uh, risk of the loss of biodiversity and other planetary boundaries. Next slide, please. But there you can see in summary, uh, the tasks of this uh, OCAT in Dutch, OCAM in French, climate. Um, and these tasks are, in fact, uh, also the tasks I have been highlighting already when discussing this uh, graph of Simpson et al. Next slide, please. I'm uh, concluding next slide with the operationalization. From the 1st of January, we are having a budget um, uh, at our disposal. We concluded last week uh, the interaction between the administration, our administration on climate and the cabinet uh, on the terms of reference.
for a study, a study we will, where the call will be launched uh, very soon uh, in order to support the implementation of OCAM climate. You can see there the three different tasks. Um, and at the bottom, uh, at the right bottom, for example, that you can see that we are not only looking for a research network to conduct the study as such, we will have calls for other specific research topics. For example, where do to find data uh, in terms of hazards, uh, exposure and vulnerability, and what is lacking in terms of data. And then for sure, operationalizing OCAM climate means to recruit people. And that is what we will do by summer. That is from my side, Pete. I uh, hand over to you again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Could you just say, I just want to ask you just very quickly about the research network, because we have a pretty international audience here, and obviously really important that this initiative is enabling the scaling up and the internationalization and the, the, the learning initiatives. Could you just say a little bit more about that and what you might be expecting the network to help you with? Well, it will be, I mean, like, like uh, uh, any call from, from public authority, uh, we need to, to give the chance to any research network. So the call will be launched in a couple of weeks, days, weeks, and then it's up to the research network to, to respond with a proposal for the terms of reference. Um, and I highlighted the three uh, different chapters, uh, but in the terms of reference, I can tell you it's more detailed and it will be uh, more clear. Uh, so anybody who is uh, uh, happy to, to help, and yes, indeed, we will have to, to someone in the, in the research network uh, speaking in Dutch and in French, but for example, reporting in English, uh, that would be very helpful for, for us. Perfect, thank you. And again, thank you to our contributors so far for keeping us to time. So now we're gonna to move to our researchers who are gonna tell us a bit more about the focus and design of the initiatives, uh, of the initiative and highlight uh, the ongoing work, including uh, the summit that's coming up in July. So uh, I'm going to be joined now by Michael Hagenlocher, uh, Nidi Naga Batla, and Sani Okamoto from UNU EHS, UNU Chris, and UNU Merit, respectively. So I think, Michael, you are going to go first. Yes, um, many thanks, uh, Keith, for the kind introduction and uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, colleagues and friends joining from all over the world. Um, it's great to see so many participants here. Um, in light of the devastating floods, but also um, against the fact that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has recently warned again that we are very likely going to see more uh, frequent extreme events in the future um, across the globe, but also in our region. We are launching this initiative today to facilitate collaboration, learning and exchange on A, um, how we can address the growing risks of climate change, but also B and, and very importantly, how we can enable climate resilient development that is to provide answers to the questions of how can we live with these uh, increasing risks from climate change and maybe the, the combination of uh, lacking preparedness for, for such extreme events in the future. And what is very important to us is the notion of collaboration. So together with partners from the region, but not only from the region, also from other um, flood prone and flood affected areas um, around the world, we want to exchange experiences. We want to identify key knowledge gaps, uh, pressing questions that require um, scientific research and answers. Um, we want to develop a comprehensive research agenda that um, hopefully can inform climate policy, not only at the national level or the, the, the regional level, but also um, down to the local level and inform drive action. And most importantly, um, this is about fostering collaboration and exchange and learning on innovation and transformation towards climate resilience. Next slide, please. In terms of um, thematic areas that we want to look into, you can see that the initiative has um, six main thematic uh, clusters, um, ranging from uh, understanding risks associated with uh, climate extremes 
to questions of how prepared are individuals, what's the level of risk awareness, um, how does that translate into behavior um, and, and response. Um, we also want to look into questions of early warning and uh, early warning communication, um, but also emergency response and coordination um, into questions of insurance markets, which role can, this is a, a heat debate at the moment, which role can also insurance play in building back better. So not only building back the way we had it before, but also enabling that we're better prepared for future events. And of course, this is also, and I think this panel shows it, is a lot about multi-level and cross-border governance. Um, how can we work together to solve this issue as a whole of society approach? And lastly, um, we want to emphasize that we really want to look into innovation and adaptation. And here, as we live in a risk society, I can go back to a book published by Beck in 1992 already. Um, the question is, if we're now in this risk society, and I think it's very evident to all of us with COVID and the floods and all the extreme events that we that are featured in the news almost every day, um, how can we actually deal with those events better in the future to enable climate resilient development? And here I would hand over to my colleague, um, Nidhi, who's gonna uh, talk about a couple of selected highlights. Thank you, Michael. And once again, uh, hello from Belgium. In this slide, I'm going to show you some key highlight, highlights of the team and the experts from the project have been involved in the past six months. We have tried to outline some knowledge for, uh, outputs to steer the climate change science and policy discourse. And that, um, that said, uh, the United Nations Regional Information Center in Belgium also showcased a project very recently in their, in, in, in their web story. We also had some knowledge outposts talking about climate grief, the climate health nexus in particular, and also on the psychology of climate negotiations. So uh, these are some of the selected outputs. In terms of outreach and engagement, the project had the opportunity to present a session at the European Forum of Disaster Risk Reduction in November last year where we shared about our objectives and we also solicited the call for contribution and partnerships. Uh, we also uh, focused on youth and we organized the second United Nations Global Sustainable Solutions Winter School in collaboration with the United Nations Environmental Program and several other collaborators in January this year. Also coming is the call for contributions to solicit research contributions from both Global South and Global North researchers on water-related disasters and risk in sustainability journals. And these are some highlights and many more will come, so keep following us. I hand over to my colleague, Sunny now. Hello, everyone. The, I'm from UN Emeritus and Okamoto from Maastricht in the Netherlands. As our first milestone of the initiative, we are organizing a conference Flood Knowledge Summit in the first week of July this year. We aim to host multi stakeholders to share dialogues on how we can build resilient societies and to facilitate learning from previous events and other flood affected regions, including Global South. The summit will be held in Maastricht, the Netherlands, and also in a hybrid format with interactive and collaborative sessions, including practitioners' panel sessions and also youth track. The announcement is forthcoming and we will keep you posted. In the meantime, please visit our website or feel free to contact us. We hope to see you in July. Perfect. Okay. Is that it from you guys? Thank you so much. Absolutely bang on time. I'm very impressed. Um, so we're now going to hand over to the directors. So we have uh, we have three directors. We have Xiaomeng Shen from UNU EHS. We have Bartel Van de Valla from UNU Merit, and Philippe de Lombardi from UNU Chris. So I think that Xiaomeng, you're going to go first. Thank you very much, Keith. Um, I would like to start to congratulate the team on this achievement already. Well, today is the official launch, but from what we have heard, they have already had significant outputs. 
VH visibility through the events we organized and participated, VH uh, plans scientific publication. So a very warm congratulation to the team. And the launch event today is indeed a very special event. It's special for multiple reasons. One of the reasons is obviously that we have government representatives from three countries. I'm so delighted to see you here present. And I want to give our donor, the German Ministry of Education and Research, a special thank you for funding this initiative. So this shows how invested Germany is for climate resilience. And your presence, Sarah, representing Petra, is very important for us. Uh, thank you very much for being here with us. And the second uh, special thing for me is really the content of the project. Merit uh, is very much focusing on innovation. So this project will also capitalize on innovation. We want to create a positive narrative instead of the usual, um, the business as usual, uh, do a normal research. So we want to learn from uh, some positive examples. Uh, for instance, the Copenhagen cloudburst in 2011, the city has managed to remake the city. Um, not only improving the water system, uh, flood protection, but also improving people's well-being and also the quality of life. So we want to use that kind of powerful positive narrative to enable the three countries to recover better and rebuild better. And the third um, thing which is very special to me is really the UNU collaboration across three UNU institutes. This is the one of the kind collaboration within UNU. To my knowledge, this is the first uh, such intense collaboration. So I want to thank Battelle for initiating this Climate Resilience Initiative and also Philippe of Fris uh, for supporting us with this. Um, I think the beauty of this project is also to enable our researchers to build mixed teams. This has already emerged. Uh, but not only that, we also have master students at Merit and uh, EHS. And the master students will also build mix, mix tree, uh, mixed team to work together. So it's really combine not only the knowledge of different institutes, but also combine education and research. Um, I think the whole spirit of this initiative is collaboration, mutual support, and also uh, solidarity. I think that's the very spirit the world needs very urgently today. Uh, this initiative is an excellent example for that, collaboration, mutual support, and solidarity. With that, I'll stop here. I want to wish this initiative a lot of success and, of course, a lot of fun. Back to you. Fun. That's a good point. Um, thank you. Uh, Bartel, you next. Thank you very much. And um, a warm welcome to uh, everybody who is tuning in to this uh, special event online. Um, about 120 participants. This is amazing from all, and from all over the world. So very good to see. Um, thank you for joining. Um, we took this initiative uh, quite shortly. We had the first discussions after, of course, the tremendous uh, floods here last summer and the impact it had on our three countries. And we quickly realized that this is not a single country's problem. It's a problem of countries that are connected, um, as in our case, but also that we have uh, seen this before. The shock, perhaps, to us was it could actually also happen here. But of course, there have been floods that were devastating in a lot of places in the world, uh, usually in the global south, with a tremendous impact on life and infrastructure. What we aim to do with this initiative is not only to do research on what happened here, but also to learn from what happened in these other countries, how they dealt with it, what their solutions were, what their approaches were. So we hope that um, through this initiative, we can also really listen to the research findings from over there and learn from them. Um, 
And this is exactly a role where a UN university institute like ours, the three of us who joined forces here today, that we can work on um, in, in the best way possible. We have an enormous network. We have institutes across the globe. So let us unite and join forces and involve the world in this program. That is where we probably differ from normal universities and that we have a role to play. So I'm, as Xiaomeng said, I'm also very pleased to see that collaboration among the three institutes that happen to be in this corner of Europe and that we are so close and that we can actually work together. Moreover, I was actually born in Bruges. I'm particularly happy to work with the Institute in Bruges here. Uh, so Philip, it's a pleasure to have you on board as well as the Institute in Bonn. Um, reference was made to results from the Stockholm Resilience uh, Institute, uh, an institute that we work with on several levels. Many of us are very familiar with the institute and I hope that we can also uh, link to institutes in the global south. There are tremendously well-equipped and well-functioning research uh, institutes in uh, South Africa, for instance, where you quoted from, I think, Bernard with your paper. So um, let's connect the global knowledge and not only connect, let's also activate it because it is time to act. Um, we all know how little time we have left before uh, it's, it's going to be too late. And increasingly, we are aware of that. We are being pushed in that direction by young people um, who point us um, very frequently and very urgently to our responsibility. So it's also our responsibility to act. So let's act globally together and advance the response and the preparedness of our societies. UN New Marriage Agenda is on comprehensive innovation. So we look at innovation from a number of perspectives, from of course technology, technological innovation, but also policy innovation, governance of innovation. We combine that in a new agenda at the Institute. And for me, this initiative is probably the perfect illustration to move ahead. We're also talking about societal transformation because we need to transform. And I think that agenda, while it is now um, well accepted in the academic world and we start to move forward into the implementation of that, also this initiative can serve as an example on initiating, advancing this transformation that we need. So um, with this initiative, very happy to see the connectiveness, happy to see the global interest in today. Let, it, let us attack this, uh, this question, tackle this question, move forward and have an impact on the policies that are being developed. So thank you very much. And um, I hope to, uh, that you all stay involved in this initiative. Thank you, Bartel. And I'll just come on to Philip in a second, but if anyone has any final comments, particularly for the directors as we have them on the screen, then put them in the chat box and maybe we can address them in a moment or two. Um, Philippe, please, your comments. Okay, thank you very much, Keith. And thanks, uh, colleagues. Uh, greetings from uh, Bruges in uh, Belgium. Um, we are also very glad to, to be part of this uh, initiative and to be able to, to contribute to it. Um, Union Chris is uh, an interdisciplinary institute huh, which uh, focuses on regional cooperation, multi-level governance. And we look at the horizontal uh, cross-border cooperation that is taking place between states, but also involving subnational entities, uh, non-state actors. We also look at the vertical interactions between different levels of governance, and we look at these dynamics in, in, in a number of policy areas, including um, climate. Now, in the context of this uh, initiative, UNUCRIS has a particular uh, interest in analyzing how institutional contexts and designs of more specific risk management systems have an impact on policy effectiveness and the preparedness of citizens facing disasters like the floodings that we were describing in, in Belgium, uh, Germany, and, and the Netherlands. And I would, I would even add, uh, given the dramatic consequences, and they have been uh, mentioned already, and the human costs uh, that, that, that we have seen, I think it's, it's, it's our obligation uh, to draw lessons from these, uh, from these events. Um, from an academic perspective, you could say in a way that, that the floodings that we have seen in this border area between Belgium, the Netherlands and, and Germany 
can be considered as a sort of natural experiment uh, where an event has caused a, a number of um, effects in different institutional contexts. And I think we should, we should look into this and, and, and look at this relationship between institutions and, and policy effectiveness. Now, if you look at the COVID crisis, uh, and there has been references to the COVID crisis already, but when you look at the COVID crisis and, and, um, and how this developed, you see that there is not a simple connection between how states are organized on the one hand and how effective they are in, in uh, facing uh, and responding to, to crisis situations. So it's not a simple uh, relationship, so you really should look at, at, at the details. Um, now, as Bartel also uh, mentioned, uh, we are your new institutes, and of course, this is a specific case, and that's where we're starting from. Uh, but the ambition is obviously to look beyond this case and to look at other cases, to connect cases, and also, and then referring to, to policy at the policy level, to, to identify best practices also uh, worldwide. Um, time is short. Uh, let me just finish with um, just highlighting what also Xiaomeng has also mentioned that this is indeed a very good example of, of intra-UNU uh, collaboration and uh, it shows really that together uh, we can do more. At the same time, and I'm talking to, to the audience uh, now, and this is, this is an open initiative. And this is an open initiative uh, and today's launch is, is, is an invitation really to, to, for researchers I would say policymakers and citizens to, to, to connect to this initiative. So don't hesitate to, to reach out to us, uh, to, to contact us uh, at some point. So looking forward to, to working with you on this and back to uh, Keith. Thank you, Philippe. Thank you all. Uh, now, we are kind of on time um, and we want the chats and the input and the conversations to continue in various ways. So, you know, you, you will see more from us uh, very shortly. So um, what I'm just going to do now is just uh, basically direct, oh, excuse me, uh, basically uh, thank everybody. Uh, I, look, we've covered so much ground. Um, we've got so many important threads and ideas to pick up on, but I guess my key takeaway is just how important the collaboration, the learning is at local cross-border levels. They're absolutely vital to understanding and resolving uh, what is frankly the biggest challenge facing all of us. Um, so if I may, I would also add perhaps the challenge of communicating our research and policy proposals. Uh, and you know the ideas that come from this initiative uh, and others like it um, and we really do need to put these ideas into action so i'm going to draw the event to a close now i want to thank the panelists the policymakers, directors and the researchers and everyone who's helped us put together uh, this event thomas in particular um, as well of, of course as our audience um, so but that's both those of you who joined us live and who will be watching the recording. So I'm going to issue a plea to everyone watching to keep a close eye on the UNU Climate Resilience Initiative website and look out for more information on July's Flood Knowledge Summit. So I very much hope we've inspired you and convinced you uh, this is one initiative that you need to keep an eye on. So please stay involved and thank you all again very much.